So now, uh, today, we are going to talk about uh, the Paticca Samuppada. Now, how many of you have at least read what is called the Paticca Samuppada? I told you about uh, a certain law of nature that uh, people began to understand in the West. Around the the 10th century, yeah? And that was the time when science began in the West. And people began to understand this law which is called uh, determinism. Determinism means that whatever happens in the world, all natural phenomena, they are all determined by the presence of the necessary conditions. When the necessary conditions are present, it happens or it occurs. And when the necessary conditions are absent, it doesn't happen. Even if one condition is absent, it doesn't happen. That is the meaning of determinism. Understood? Now, when people began to realize this, they lost faith in the religious dogmas because the religious dogmas were telling people that this world was created by a God and this God is controlling everything. So if there is lightning, if there is thunder, if there are earthquakes, tornadoes, hurricanes, all that is done by God. But when these scientists began to understand this law of determinism, that everything that happens is happening only due to the presence of the necessary conditions, they lost faith in the religious dogmas. And as a result, revolutions took place like the... Uh, what revolution? French. French. Huh? French. The French and the American... French Revolution? Marxist Revolution? Yeah. There was a British Revolution? And in these revolutions, they started killing even the kings and even the ascetics. Not ascetics, uh, the Religious. priests, priests in the churches. So all these things happened because they lost faith in the religious dogmas. And this period is called the Age of Enlightenment. That is the time when people began to understand the realities of life. It was uh, somewhere in the 20th century that Sigmund Freud began to see 
something else. That he saw that this same law is governing what we call the mind. Just as they saw that there is no God to create the world, this Freud began to see that there is no self who does the thinking. Even the thinking, speaking and acting happens only due to the presence of the necessary conditions. So he called this psychic determinism. That's important to understand. That means that determinism is a law that is governing even the human mind. Although he used the words ego and superego, they were only words for him. Those words didn't represent a real self. He used this because when people talk about a self, there is only one thing that you can refer to as the self, and that is what is called the cognitive process, which is an activity of the brain. There is a special part of the brain that does the thinking, that is called the cerebrum or the cerebral cortex. And that is what can be called a self that is doing the thinking. If you want to use the word self, that is the only self which is simply a part of the body, not something outside the body. So, uh, the thinking is done by that cerebral cortex, which is doing what is called cognition. And uh, the Buddha pointed out that there are two processes going on which we refer to as the mind. really three processes. The first is the activity of the senses. When the senses are stimulated by the environment, light falling on the eye, sounds coming to the ears, smells coming to the nose, taste coming to the tongue, and touch coming to the body all coming from the environment. And when when the environment stimulates the senses, the senses react to the stimulus. And that reaction is what we call seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching. We are organisms in an environment and the organism reacts to the environmental stimulation. And that is how we become conscious of a world. But 
that consciousness is not coming from the senses. A chain reaction occurs in the body. That means a, a series of reactions occur in the body. The first reaction is seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching. That's the first reaction. Then the message goes from the senses to the brain and the brain begins to think and give meaning to what was seen, heard, smelt, tasted, touched. And that giving meaning is what is called cognition. Those are words used by modern psychologists. And then, according to the meaning given, an emotion is aroused. The emotional arousal comes from the meaning given. And then, then your emotion is expressed in action. The emotion is expressed in action. So we become conscious of a world and not only conscious of a world, we become conscious of a self living in the world. So you see, these are three parts of this chain reaction. First comes perception, then comes cognition, then comes affection. The emotional arousal is called affection. And then comes action. in the form of speech or physical behavior. Hmm? If you first see some person and that person is doing something or speaking something and then that is perception. The next is, this message goes to the brain and the brain begins to think and interpret what was done by that person. And if you interpret that as an insult to you, said something that is an insult to you or did something that is a disrespect to for you, something like that, you interpret it like that. And the moment you interpret it like that, a message goes from the brain to a gland and the gland secretes a hormone into the blood and the blood carries this, the blood vessels carry it to the whole body and the changes take place in the body. And that is an emotional arousal. And in this case, it was anger. And when the mind became angry, now you act in the angry way. You start using bad language and then you start fighting. And uh, that is what anger is about. 
So that whole reaction is a chain reaction. One reaction followed by another reaction. It's the chain. Different links in the chain. So that reaction you have to understand that properly. So, for the purpose of uh, speaking about it uh, more easily, we divide this into two main actions. One is cognition and the other is affection. Cognition is the thinking part and affection refers to the emotional arousal and the emotional behavior. So you see, so when we speak of the mind, that is all that we are referring to. The cognitive thinking part and the emotional arousal. Now when we speak of emotions, we are only forming ideas, imagining. We are not referring to what is really going on in the body. What I just mentioned was what is really going on in the body. But normally people don't know what is really going on in the body. And so, the only words that normally people use is head and heart. The thinking part is called the head and the emotional part is called the heart. There is some connection between the head and the heart because the thinking is the activity of the brain, so it is correct to call it the head. And the emotional part is really the activity of the blood in the heart. So therefore, it is okay to call it the heart, the emotion. Now the important thing is that whole process is what the Buddha called dukkha or suffering. In other words, it is the reaction of the organism to stimulation. Now in the animals, normally the lower animals, they, they don't have emotions. Like even the fish doesn't have emotions. This is why it is easy for you to catch a fish. You put a bait on a thread and then throw it into the pond or wherever the fish you find and then uh, they'll come and swallow that. The moment it is swallowed, they are caught. So they will go on doing that, they will never learn that they are getting caught by swallowing this. They can't think and they don't have emotions. Now, if you see a frog inside the house, 
Have you ever tried to chase that frog out of the house? You have never experienced that, huh? Never seen a frog. In Sri Lanka, yes. Huh? In Sri Lanka. In Sri Lanka you have seen. But if you try to chase the frog out, what happens? Huh? Thank you. Jumps. Huh? Just jumps around. No, the ch frog doesn't go away. <laughs> it comes it back sad. again. Very difficult to get rid of that frog. That frog is not frightened. No emotions. The frog doesn't have any emotions. This is the reason. Huh? Emotions come only to a higher animals. Because there is a part of the brain which is called the limbic system. And it is that part of the brain that is responsible for the emotions. How the animals like the dog, the cat, those are emotional animals. They have emotions. But they don't have this ability to think and reason out. In their brain, they don't have that uh, cerebrum developed. So you see, it's only the, the brain is there, but they can't think and reason out like the human beings. It is the human being who has a well-developed cerebrum. So the human being can think and reason out. So this is why, but you know, even in the human being, There is a nerve because uh, it is like the other animals, like the emo uh, emotional animals. Because they don't have to think, they act straight away, they act emotionally. The dog hearing a sound begins to bark. That is, you don't have to think for that. You just hear the sound and then straight away bark. Because the message goes to the gland and the gland sends a message to the muscles and the muscles become activated and that is how the barking comes up. So you see, it's good to learn this body and how the brain works. Then you begin to understand this thing called mind and all these mental processes. The important thing is the human being also has that now, that is sending the message straight from the sense organ, like the eye or the ear or something, and uh, going straight to the muscles. Now, this is why if you suddenly hear a big noise, you get excited. Why? Because the message goes even before 
going to the brain to do the thinking goes straight to the action part. Then later you go, ah, there is nothing to get excited, it's only a, a noise coming from something. Then you begin to think and understand that. Then you calm down again. Hmm? Now some of these psychologists have uh, used a word to explain this. It is called a hijack. That means the 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 brain has been hijacked. You know what a hijack is, huh? But then it is only temporary thing because then the brain begins to understand what has happened and then you calm down again. So, the important thing is, uh, this, this whole reaction, this chain reaction, is producing all the problems in the world. Crime, wars, killings, <coughs> everything that is happening in the world, where human beings behave in a certain ways and how animals behave in certain ways, all that is because of this reaction. That is the dukkha. So the Buddha decided the only way to solve this problem is the, that these human beings have to evolve further. It's evolution. Now, the scientists think that the modern human being is the most evolved animal. But the Buddha pointed out that this highest evolved animal has to evolve further. Only then that the crime was terrorism, all these kinds of things will disappear. Only when the man, human being evolves. But this time the evolution is not a biological evolution. It has to become a psychological evolution. The biological evolution took place unconsciously. As Charles Darwin saw it, it came out as a struggle for existence. The struggle to exist. Because Every individual organism, not only human beings, even animals and even plants, what are they doing? They are struggling to exist. Even plants are struggling to exist. They want to keep on existing. They don't want to die. Although they are struggling to exist, they have to somehow die. 
But the struggle is going on unconsciously. In the plants and even the animals, it is only in the human being that the human being is struggling to exist consciously. And it is the human being who is able to realize that he or she is struggling to exist. And not only struggling to exist, that the struggle is futile. And not only futile, it is also painful. You see, now the children are being looked after by the parents. So they don't see that this, there is a struggle because the parents will provide the food, clothing, shelter, even medicine when they are sick. So the children don't, they are not aware of this. But when they grow up and become adults, then they begin to realize that they have to struggle to exist. And this is why they have to go to school and learn. If they are able to learn and uh, something at least, they can do a job and get money. Otherwise they'll have to do a job which is a menial job and get just a little money, just enough to maybe find food. But there are other things that they have to find. Food, they have to find clothing, they have to find shelter, and they have to find medicine. But there is another problem coming up. They have this, what is called the sexual appetite. So they want to begin to find partners to have sexual <coughs> And for that also you need money. You can't do it with, if you don't have money. So you see, <laughs> so for everything, you have to struggle. Money, to get money you have to struggle. You have to do jobs. Whether you like it or not, you have to do it. You see, that whole life is a struggle <coughs> to exist. And in spite of this struggle, you have to die. It's not only old people who die. Young people also die. Even children die. Even a child just born can die. Or a child can die even before birth, while in the mother's womb. You see, death there is no time for death. It can come at any moment. This is the insecurity of life. The insecurity of life is because there is this struggle to exist and at the same time there is death which can come at any moment. 
This is the insecurity of life that the Buddha spoke of. And now people are gradually beginning to realize this. Hundred years ago they didn't even want to think about it. Now some people are writing books. about death and dying, about how to face death. How to go and talk to the those who are about to die and things like that. And children, they are never shown dead bodies. They don't take the children to funerals. So they don't know much about death. Of course, in the Eastern countries, they still have debts at home. But here they never have a funeral at home. It's only in the funeral homes. And children are not taken there. So things like that, you see. But gradually people are beginning to realize or become aware of the realities of life. So the biggest problem is that people grow old, fall sick and die. This is what Prince Siddhartha saw. Because he was also not shown any of these things. As a child he didn't know about that. He didn't know that he was going to die. And he didn't know that people in the world die or grow old. But gradually he began to know this. And he thought, he must find a solution to this. And so, that is why he set out. He thought that normal human beings, being subject to old age, disease and death, they go and become attached to things that are subject to old age. They cling to them. But he thought that is the wrong thing to do. You should learn to give up attachment to things that are subject to old age, disease and death. And people should learn to purify their minds. It is only by purifying the mind you can become happy. So he went to learn meditation from yogis at that time. And it is by learning meditation that he learned to enter the first jhana, the second jhana, which we call the ecstasy, the first ecstasy that we described last time, the second ecstasy, 
the third ecstasy, the fourth ecstasy, and at the fourth ecstasy, you stop the affective part. The emotional part. Actually, the emotions stop because emotion is an activity, and that activity stops when you enter the first jhana, the first ecstasy. Ecstasy, I said, was standing out. What is the other word we use for standing out? Transparent. Huh? Trans transparent. What? Transparent. What? Tra sorry, transcendence. Transcendence. Ah, oh, transcend. Yes. Well, uh, yes, but there is a simpler word. It is to withdraw. You withdraw from. Say, this is the world of sensual living. You withdraw from that. You come out of that. So, when you enter the first jhana, you have withdrawn from the sensual world of uh, emotional excitement. You have withdrawn from emotional excitements. Huh? But when you enter the fourth jhana, All excitements completely disappear. And then you begin to withdraw from the cognitive activity. The cognitive process is the process that makes you think, and that thinking process begins to stop when you enter the sphere of infinite space or the realm of infinite space, the realm of perception. When you withdraw from the realm of perception, you withdraw from all almost all experience, and there you come to what is called the realm of nothingness. There is nothing there. But that nothingness itself becomes a thought. So you withdraw from that also. That is where you enter that state called neither sensation nor no sensation. That is the threshold of consciousness. And you withdraw from that also. 
and you come to nothingness. You come to the cessation of sensation and feeling. There is no feeling of sensitivity, of sentience. That is the stopping of what is called the mind. Mind is an activity and that activity stops at that point. And when you come to that point... Can I ask you a question? Yeah? How do you go from neither sensation or not sensation to cessation? How what? Do you, how do you go from the eighth jhana to cessation? How do you go from neither perception or not perception? What is cessation? What are you calling cessation? I'm calling cessation no, no feeling, no perception. No perception. Yeah, no perception. Yeah, that is the cessation of sensation and feeling. Right. Mm -hmm. So, if you're in neither sensation nor non-sensation, how do you go into no sensation? No sensation. Now, when you say there is no, neither sensation nor no sensation, is there any sensation there? It's hard to tell. Huh? It, it's hard to tell. Like No, no, it is the state where the sensation, you cannot say the sensation is present or absent. You can't say it is present or absent. That is the meaning of neither sensation nor no sensation. So that I'm means that is the threshold of consciousness. So that I'm means it's like you're at the door. So when you're at the door, how do you go out of the door? Yeah, how do you withdraw? So you just withdraw, go beyond that. That means that is the cessation of sensation and uh, feeling. That means that also you let go. You have to understand that this is not a person going anywhere. It is an activity that stops. So it is simply the stopping of an activity. It is not a person going from one place to another. There is no self here. It is, there is only an activity. The activity is like a flame. When the flame stops, where did the flame go? It just stopped. Ah. Because it is an activity that has stopped. It is not a thing that has gone somewhere. So that is what happens, the cessation of things. But then, this activity can start again. So when that activity has stopped, do you know anything? There is no knowledge. That is the meaning of avijja. You know avijja, the word avijja is translated as ignorance. 
But I translate that as unconsciousness. There is no consciousness. Now, ignorance is simply saying that there is no knowledge. But you may be conscious. You first you are conscious and then you begin to know things. But here we are talking about the absence of consciousness. So avijja is the absence of consciousness. And that is why it is called unconscious. You understand? So it's not ignorance. And from a state of absence of consciousness, again it can start again. And the moment you start, you are in that process of neither perception nor no perception. That is the threshold, means just at the door and then you come out, come in again and you come to the nothingness and from the nothingness you come to the perception and from there you come to infinite space and from infinite space you come to the fourth ecstasy, then the third ecstasy, then the second ecstasy, and then the first ecstasy. And it is in that first ecstasy that you have questioning, and answering. The questioning and answering means you have started thinking. That is where the thinking starts. Formation of concepts. Hmm? So in the second jhana, there's not really thinking. No thinking. Yeah. If second jhana. If you're in the second jhana and you try to think, it's uncomfortable. You don't try to think in the second jhana. Yeah. That thinking comes only in the first jhana. You have to understand that all these jhanas are levels of calm. That's the important thing. These are levels of calmness. And if you enter a certain level of calm, and when you come out of that level of calm, you can't be just highly excited. Because you have entered a certain level of calm. To get out of that calm, you have to... You need a long time to get out of that calm. You can't just suddenly get excited after you have reached that level of calm. That, that calm, it, it stays in you, in your it, body. It stays in you for some time. Yes. Not just one day. Mm -hmm. It will stay for you for several days. You can't come out of that so easily. No, but that doesn't mean that uh, to come out of the fourth jhana to the third jhana, you need a lot of time. 
that's not what I'm saying. But if you have reached the fourth jhana, even if you come out of the first jhana, you are still calm to a great extent. So that means that these jhanas are not just uh, something that you can just enter very quickly and then come out very quickly. That's not a thing like that. But there is another thing that you have to understand. That is what is called the hypnotic state. The hypnotic state is not a jhana. Most people enter the hypnotic state and imagine that they have entered jhana. So this is the biggest mistake that people can make. Most people who claim to have entered the jhana, they have only entered the hypnotic state. And this is why a person who has uh, practice metta, karuna, mudita and upekka, they can do all kinds of mischievous things. They have not practiced metta. Karuna is a higher level than metta. And mudita is a level higher than karuna. And Upekka is a level higher than Mudita. You understand? Son, if you... Those are really the same thing as first jhana, second jhana, third jhana, fourth jhana. That Metta is like the first jhana. Karuna is like the second jhana. Mudita is like the third jhana. And Upekka is like the fourth jhana. So these are all levels of calm. And a person who has reach those levels of calm, they can't get excited suddenly. That is what it is. Hmm. But the hypnotic state, you can enter very quickly. Most people enter the hypnotic state and imagine they have entered the jhanas. If you begin to concentrate, you will automatically enter the hypnotic state. Because the word hypnosis was coined by a, a doctor who was a, Psychology doctor, he was a person from England called Dr. Bread, and his method, he is the one who started this thing called hypnosis. Because before hypnosis, there was a man called Mesma. Frank Anton Mesmer. He was uh, in France or some place. And uh, Dr. Bread wanted to find out what Mesmer did. 
because mesma had some critics who criticized mesma and said that mesma was not doing the right thing he was uh, uh, what you call uh, seducing he was seducing huh what he was seducing women in the courts he was trying to i don't know about uh, seducing women <laughs> but uh, actually he was uh, a fake that's what the people called him and uh, there was a there was a committee appointed to examine him and ultimately the committee said he was a fake and that he was really uh, using the imagination of people and uh, he was doing a trick and ultimately he was banned from the country he had to go to another country and uh, he stopped practicing what he called mesmerism and ultimately he died but this dr bread came from england he became interested in finding out what mesma was doing and ultimately he found that those people who examined examined the right thing but mesma also was doing the right thing and uh, he was using imagination and imagination is a very useful thing and it can cure diseases and that is how he produced what is called the hypnotic state what mesma was doing was producing the hypnotic state and he used hypnosis to cure diseases and he coined the word hypnosis hypnosis simply means sleeping but everyone who goes to sleep goes through the hypnotic state there is a state between waking and sleeping and that is today called the hypnogogic state and it is an extension of the hypnogogic state that you call the hypnotic state so if you begin to concentrate on the breath or concentrate on a spot on the wall or you concentrate on a candle flame or whatever you concentrate on tires you it is a tiresome task to keep concentrating on something and when your mind gets tired it automatically goes to sleep and while you are going to sleep if you are trying to be awake you get into the hypnotic state without your knowledge and once you are in the hypnotic state you begin to hallucinate and when you begin to hallucinate that is what people call nimitta and that nimitta will keep you in the hypnotic state you know 
some time back, I was uh, invited to teach a course at the University of Vermont. In that University of Vermont, there were students and the teachers living in the same building. So I was also given uh, something like uh, one of these apartments. There was a, there were two rooms. One room was my bedroom, then there was an, another bedroom and two bedrooms and there was an area which is the kitchen and there was another area which was uh, like the dining room. And of course there was the bathroom. And uh, so it was like a two bedroom apartment. And so, but I didn't have any uh, other people living in my apartment but I was the only person living in my apartment. But uh, some of the students want to, wanted to learn meditation from me. But I was not there to teach meditation. I was there to just give some talks to a different uh, a class. Uh, was about religion. So I was... Uh, talking about Buddhism as a philosophy. But because these uh, students wanted to learn meditation, I used one of those rooms to teach meditation. So every day they used to come at a certain time to learn meditation. And so they were all sitting there and trying to practice meditation. <coughs> so I also spoke to them about meditation. So there were these students who were practicing meditation in different ways. And they told me how they entered the jhanas and all kinds of experiences they had. They, some, some had the experience of coming out of the body and the mind going out and seeing things and it comes back again. And what are called out-of-body movements and different kinds of experiences they were talking about. So I told them, you have only the entered the hypnotic state. You have not entered the jhanas. And uh, you are only hallucinating. Once you are in the hypnotic state, you can hallucinate. There was a girl who was studying to become an engineer. So these girls who study to become engineers, they are quite intelligent people because they studied mathematics. So mathematics is a difficult subject and so you have to be very intelligent to do mathematics. So. Uh, this girl one day came to me alone and asked me, can you hypnotize me? I said, why, why do you want to be hypnotized? 
because to show, find out whether what she is doing as meditation is the same thing as the hypnotic state. I knew that she gets hypnotized very easily. I said, okay, I can put you in the hypnotic state. When she wanted to become, enter the hypnotic state, I said, okay, she was about sitting from your distance from here. I was not even close to that place. She was seated there. I was seated here. I said, just look at my hand. And I was doing this. And I said, you are going to enter the hypnotic state. And very soon she entered the hypnotic state. So when I saw that she had entered the hypnotic state, I said, okay, now you have entered the hypnotic state. I am going to take you to the moon. You like to go to the moon? She said, yes. Okay, I bring the rocket here and you will be able to see the rocket. You only have to step into the rocket and sit. And the rocket will carry you to the moon. So I, can you see the rocket? I said, yes, she can see the rocket. I said, okay, and then sit in the rocket. And she sat in the rocket. I said, now the rocket will start when I count up to ten. I start with ten, nine, eight seven, six, and when it comes to one, the rocket will start. And when it starts, you tell me what you see, because you are seated in the rocket. When it moves, you tell me what you see. I said, okay. And as, the, as a, when I came to number one, it started. And I said, you exp see, tell me what you see. And she started telling me how the earth was becoming gradually smaller and smaller, and the moon was becoming bigger and bigger, it's going to the moon. She saw all these things. And then uh, I said, okay. Uh, there'll be a point where where you'll be able to get out of the moon, of the rocket, and float in the air. And I asked her to get out at that point and float, and she was able to do that also, and then come back again. And all these experiences she had. And ultimately, when uh, she came close to the moon, she told me, now it's coming close to the moon. And I said, okay, now the rocket will come and land on the moon. She saw the rocket landing. And I said, uh, okay, now you have seen the landing on the moon. Now come out of the moon, out of the rocket, and step onto the moon. So she did that. I said, now walk on the moon. And I said, you'll be able to see the flag the American flag. I asked, can you see the American flag? Yes, she saw the American flag. Then I said, okay, now salute the flag. 
So she saluted the flag. And I said, okay, walk further. You are going to see a, a yogi. And then I asked, can you see the yogi? He said, yes, I can see the yogi. I said, uh, speak to him, ask him some questions. So he just spoke, spoke to the yogi. And I asked, what, what did the yogi say? So she told me some things that he was saying. I said, okay, now you bow to the yogi and now you go further. You are going to meet uh, Jesus Christ. And she met this Jesus there. So I said, uh, okay, you speak to him also. And you tell me what he says. And uh, she told me what he was saying. I said, okay, good. Now you bow to him also. And you go further. You are going to meet the Buddha, I said. So she met the Buddha also. So I asked him to speak to the Buddha and then she spoke to the Buddha and then uh, I said, okay, now you bow to the Buddha also and now you, you return to the rocket, you are going back to the rocket and she went back then again sat in the rocket and uh, I said, now the rocket will start again and you tell me what you see when you go back to the earth now. And as she, uh, as she described what for, she began to see how the earth was becoming bigger and bigger and the moon was becoming smaller. And ultimately it began to land on the earth and like that gradually it came down to the earth and I said, okay, now it will come here to this room and now you can uh, get out of the rocket and sit on this chair. So she got out of the rocket and sat on the chair. I said, you have seen a very interesting thing. Now when I ask you to wake up, you will wake up and you'll remember everything that happened and you can tell me about your experience. And she woke up and then I asked whether that experience is similar to the kind of experience you had when you were meditating. She said, yes. So she agreed that it was the hypnotic state that she was experiencing. So, this is the kind of thing that happens. Huh? So, you have to be able to distinguish between the hypnotic state and the real jhana, jhana and hypnosis are two different things. So it's very important to understand that. Ah, the clock. <laughs>
Can you can you talk about Paticca Samapada in two minutes? Huh? Paticca Samapada in two minutes? <laughs> well, the thing is this: the Paticca Samapada is simply that Avijja is simply that. State of unconsciousness. Now, after Avijja, the Buddha speaks about Sankara. Sankara simply means that activity, the mental activity. Three kinds of Sankara. What is called Khai Sankara, Vachi Sankara, and uh, Chitta Sankara. Khai Sankara is the activity of breathing in and breathing out. Vachi Sankara is that activity of forming concepts, asking the, the questions and answering the question. What is this? This is a bag. What is this? This is a speaker. What is this? A tape recorder. Like that, you see? What is this? The table. What is this? A cloth. So this is the most fundamental process of thinking, forming concepts. That is what is called Vachi Sankara, which is the Vitakka and the Vichara. Vitakka, Vichara is the questioning, Vitakka is the inference, con forming a co conclusion. You ask the question and answer the question. That is Vachi Sankara. And Chitta Sankara is Vedana and Sanya. Vedana is the feeling whether it is pleasant or unpleasant. Sanya refers to either the color that you see or the sound that you hear, that this is the sanya. So that is the most basic and that is the, when you, from that unconscious state, the first thing that you come to is the Vedana sanya. That Vedana sanya, that is the Chitta Sankara. And when you come out the, in the first jhan, you get the Vitak Vichara. So that is the thinking part. And when that thinking part comes, that is Vijnana. So Sankara Pacha Vijnana. So from Avijja, you come to Sankara. And from Sankara, you become, you perceive, perception. Vijnana is not consciousness, Vijnana is perception. And when you perceive, you perceive an object. The object you perceive is the Rupa. Rupa simply means a mental image. The eye is like a camera and the camera takes pictures. And the picture is the Rupa. Rupa means the picture, the mental picture or mental image. And every mental image you form you give a name to it, to identify it. That name is the Nama. 
Nama simply means the name given to the Rupa. So when there is Pinyana, which is the process of perception, the object perceived is the Nama Rupa. And this way, you are not only seeing with your eyes, you are also hearing with your ears, smelling with your nose, tasting with your tongue, and touching with your body. And there you get a world. What you call the world is not an object there, but what you see, what you hear, what you smell, what you taste, what you touch. That is called the Salayatana, the six realms. The six realms are the world. Normally people think of a thing called world, but that world is simply a product of seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching. So instead of calling the world, the Buddha called it the six realms of perception. Or the six spheres of perception. That's what it is. Then, from Salayatana you get what is called Passa. Passa is always translated as contact, which is wrong. That Passa is really becoming conscious. That is the consciousness. You have become conscious of a world outside. So becoming conscious of the world outside is Passa. Now, from there, you see, at the beginning, two things came into being from the state of unconsciousness. What are those two things? Vedana and Sanya. You became unconscious because of the cessation of Vedana and Sanya. Sanya Veda Ita Nirodha. Sanya Veda Ita Nirodha. But the first thing that comes up is Sanya and Vedana. But this whole process that we were thinking about from Sankara to Vijnana, Vijnana to Namarupa, Namarupa, Salayatana, Salayatana to Passa. You are really talking about the cognitive process. And the cognitive process started with Sanya. This is why I am always saying that it is very important to understand the Pali words. If you get into English words, you will not see Patitasamapa. And understand the meaning of the Pali words. The English words take you different direction. Talking about something else, because the translations have been wrong. The translations have been misleading people. 
because the translator himself has misunderstood. This is the problem. So what we were discussing all this time was the cognitive process. Now comes the affective process. From Vedana comes the affective process. Vedana means the pleasant, unpleasant and neutral sensation. Vedana is the pleasant, unpleasant and neutral sensation. From that comes the emotional reaction to the Vedana. That is tanha. That emotional reaction is tanha. Tanha is kama tanna, bhava tanna, vibhava tanna. Kama tanna comes from the pleasant sensation. Reaction to the pleasant sensation is kama tanna. Reaction to the pleasant sensation. The reaction to the neutral sensation is bhavatana. Bhava means being, not becoming. The translators translated the word bhava as becoming. Bhava is not becoming. Bhava means being. Being means existing. Being means existing. Now the neutral sensation gives you the idea of existence. Now this is neutral, you don't have a special desire for this. But the idea there is something there. That something there means bhava. If you say a book exists, you say book means pottakam. Existence, being is bhava. Pottakam bhavati means the book exists or book is, is means being there. So the neutral sensation gives you the idea of being. And the unpleasant sensation or painful sensation, vibhava tanna. Vibhava means not being. May this not be. You don't like the unpleasant sensation to be there. You want it to not be. That is vibhava. So the kama tanna, bhava tanna and vibhava tanna refers to the emotional reaction to the sensation. Now that emotional reaction divides your experience into two. Now, seeing or becoming conscious, that is the passa was becoming conscious, to become conscious is to experience something. And that experience means there is something you experience 
and then there is the reaction to what you experience. So something that you saw and your reaction to what you saw. What you saw is seen as something outside and your reaction is inside. Your reaction is mine or my reaction is mine and I reacted. You see? So you have personalized the reaction. So the reaction is tanha, which is wrongly translated as craving. It is not craving, it is the emotional reaction. And that emotional reaction made you personalize the reaction. Reaction is mine. Personalize is to say, this is mine. And once the mind comes, I comes into being. So the mind created the I. I is the Bhava. Bhava, my existence. My existence comes from personalizing the reaction. The reaction was personalized and then I came into being. And what is the I? Where did this I come from? What is the I that you are referring to? The only I you can refer to is the body. The body has become the I. Huh? The body has become the I. And this body, you think, is existing. Bhava. The body is existing. What does existing mean? What does it mean when you say existing? It is existing in time and space. And time means past, present and future. And what is the past of yourself? But Birth is the past of yourself. What is the future of yourself? Death. What is in between birth and death? Aging. Huh? Bandi, uh, right after Tanha, uh, you know, Tanha Pachaya Upadana. Yeah. Where, where Upadana is personalizing. Upa, upa adana. Upa means inside, adana means take. To take inside is to say, this is mine. That is personalizing. That's why I use the word personalize. That is the most important thing. Upadana is personalizing. And it is because of personalizing, I come into being. If it is mine, there must be an I to say mine. And that is Bhava, I come into existence. And if I come into existence, what is that existence? It is the body. That means you are personalizing the body and calling the body myself. And it is the birth of the body that you say is your birth. It is the death of the body that you are saying my death. 
It is the aging of the body that you call my aging. By personalizing the body, you have created yourself. <laughs> you see? That is why the Buddha says, Evatastha Kevalastha Dukkatmandas Samadhyohoti. This is how the Dukkha came into being by personalizing this whole thing. You have personalized the body, and because of that, you have birth, old age, disease, and death, which is the suffering. the insecurity of life. All that because this mental process that was going on unconsciously, this mental process is going on unconsciously. You started with unconsciousness and that unconsciousness is continuing in this whole process till the end. It is only when you have become conscious of this process that you, you realize that this is all an illusion created by the mental process. You understood? <laughs> so you have become enlightened. <laughs> huh? Um, and you awaken from the dream of existence. You think you are existing, that is a dream. And when you have understood this, you awaken from the dream of existence. That is the meaning of becoming a Buddha. Buddha is the awakened one. And that is the attainment of nirvana. It's a paradigm shift. That's what is called a paradigm shift. You are, first you thought you were existing, now you have awakened from the dream of existence. And instead of existence, this is only experience. It's only an experience and not an existence. What is normally called... Ah, the cat is also happy as a result. <laughs> So that is the end of the Paditya Samuppada. Huh? When you understand that, you will be awakened from the dream of existence. You have to see this when your mind is free of those hindrances. Hindrances are the things that prevent you from seeing this properly. It is only, this is why you have to have samatha meditation before you get into vipassana meditation. You begin to see this from the vipassana meditation, not samatha meditation. But even the vipassana, so-called vipassana today is not the real vipassana. That is why we don't have arahants today. Although there are people who claim to be arahants or are supposed to be arahants, but they are not arahants because they have not seen the Paticca Samuppada. All those who have written 
about the Paticca Samuppada are people who have never understood the Paticca Samuppada. Yes, the problem. I won't say that I have understood. This is simply what I have seen and understood. It may be wrong. I may be wrong. You have to find out for yourself. You can't just believe and accept what I said. If you see any light in what I said, it, it may be correct. If you didn't see any light in what I said, then it may not be correct. Huh?